All right. It helps if you unmute yourself. Good evening. Hello and welcome to the Conversations of the 100. My name is Ivory Freeman and I am the proud president of the 100 Black Men of San Antonio, an organization that focuses on mentoring young men of color between the ages of seven and 17. As we dynamically dive, dynamically dive into the whole process of, of of taking care of our youth there, it's important that they understand, you know, a couple of different things. You know, as many know and many do not know, our focus uh, works around uh, four premises, education, uh, professional leadership, economic empowerment, and health and wellness. So tonight on our conversations with the 100, we're going to focus on the health and wellness. So as we, we call this our healthcare 2.0 uh, in, endeavor that we started last year, and it's part of a national program uh, that we locally are supporting and with events like this tonight. So we have the proud opportunity to have some phenomenal guests to be with us here tonight. So I would like to, to take a, a second and kind of give them a chance to introduce themselves. So first I'd like to have uh, Miss Tiffany Jones to introduce herself. Miss Jones? Yes, thank you so much for having me, President Freeman. Um, my name is Tiffany Jones Smith. You gotta put that Smith on the end. You know, I, I must love him to have gone from Jones to Smith. Um, <laughs> I'm the president and CEO of the Texas Kidney Foundation. And uh, I'm very proud to be here to talk about uh, healthcare access and uh, health and wellness because uh, Texas Kidney Foundation is leading the charge um, on taking back our health for the African-American community. We have started the largest uh, public health initiative ever initiated in a single county uh, to uh, identify chronic kidney disease within our population because we know that COVID-19 has left us vulnerable in many ways and uh, one of them is through diabetes and hypertension. So uh, COVID-19 is acting as an AKI. So people who are, and that's an acute kidney injury. And what that means is that people who are recovering from COVID-19 think that they're doing great. You know, they've gotten past COVID uh, and they actually may have a ticking time bomb inside, which is, um, uh, kidney disease developing because of COVID-19. So we're, we're looking for that. And we also know that one in three are at risk for kidney disease in Texas, period. Uh, and that one in seven have some stage of kidney disease and don't know that they have it. So our goal is to identify kidney disease early, help our people uh, take the next steps from there. You know, we say all the time that if, if, uh, Kidney disease is, being, is like being pushed off a cliff. And if you're being pushed off, we're going to jump with you and help you get to the bottom. Uh, and that's what we do. Outstanding, outstanding. And, and it's, it's a, I know it's always a hard task to tell people to do the right thing. And so organizations like yourselves, I know it's always an uphill battle because, you know, in, in many industries, when you start to approach somebody, you know, the first thing is, I'm good, I'm good, you know, mm -hmm. and then, as you say, that time, that ticking time bomb catches up with them and then you can't get rid of them, right? It, they're, they they want to know everything. You know, well, I, I talk to people all the time about this because you can't, you can't tell me you're good because I've lost 12 family members to chronic kidney disease. So I know uh, if you, I know you're not good if you have it. <laughs> and and uh, I know the importance of, of being checked. So people, you know, We've had just enough for long enough in our community. We, we have had just enough information, just enough. You know, we don't trust because of the fact that we've had just enough for long enough. So we, our goal at Texas Kidney Foundation is not to tell people what to do, but it's to be there and be that helping hand to help them where they are, where they stand today. Outstanding. You know, Outstanding, outstanding. So uh, our second guest that we have with us also tonight, which I'm really excited to have, is Dr. Broman. 
Uh, so, sir, uh, I'd like uh, for you to take a little moment to, to let everybody know a little bit about you and, and why you're here with us tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Ivory. Uh, pleasure to be here. It's an honor to be here. Uh, my name is Varshi Brumand. I am a uh, nephrologist with South Texas Renal Care Group here in San Antonio. Uh, I am uh, uh, trained in nephrology and interventional nephrology. I completed my medical school training and residency at the University of Miami, and then I moved on to Vanderbilt University for my nephrology training. And I have been uh, proudly in uh, South Texas and San Antonio for the past 14 years, moved here from the Washington, D.C. area uh, to for family and, and for practice. Uh, it feels like I moved from the kidney capital, Washington, D.C., to another kidney capital, South Texas. Uh, unfortunately, uh, uh, the prevalence of diabetes has doubled the national uh, average here in South Texas. And uh, our community suffers from uh, significant uh, morbidities and mortality from diabetes and hypertension. And so uh, I, I'm here to help with awareness and uh, to help motivate people to uh, seek the care that they need and to push for uh, positive outcomes and results for their themselves and their families. So uh, great to be here. Great to help uh, uh, move the needle. Even if it's a bit, uh, every little bit helps. Uh, people don't realize how fast they can get sick and we don't want to do it when it's too late. Uh, as Tiffany indicated, it's, it's with us. It's not going anywhere looking the other way will not make it go away. It's just going to come back with a vengeance. Uh, I'm also proudly serve on the board of uh, uh, the Texas Kidney Foundation uh, with Tiffany's leadership. I'm the chairman of the board and, you know, ho hoping uh, with, with uh, the appropriate leadership with colleagues like yourself and, and everyone involved, we can uh, help our communities prosper and be healthy. Outstanding, outstanding, sir. Uh, we're we're extremely proud to have you here uh, as one of our panelists tonight. Uh, and we, we, you know, as the 100 um, has been here in the San Antonio area a little over 20 years now. Um, we've strive uh, to ensure that some of the initiatives and issues that are are impacting the African American community uh, are being heard. Uh, we started this conversation to the 100 last year uh, and we had great success. And through the great, great support of TAN TV, uh, we're able to continue to do this and reach a greater, greater audience. Um, I don't think enough can be said about the good things that TAN TV has been doing since they Amen. started their whole process. Um, it, and we're, we're blessed in the fact I said all that and you couldn't hear a thing I said, could you? I apologize. Uh, as I said, you know, we're extremely excited about the opportunity to be partnered here tonight with TAN TV. Uh, the things that they're doing, the, the outreach they have, and the ability for the 100 Black Men of San Antonio after 19 years plus uh, in the community to have a much stronger voice is a very exciting time to be here and a part of, uh, of the organization and part of the, 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 the ability to reach more people. Uh, you know, a lot of times we do things uh, in our mentoring organization uh, with the, the youth uh, throughout San Antonio, uh, Church Cibolo area, uh, that we, we don't think we're making an impact. But it's always that one person, that one child, that one parent, that one teacher, that one administrator, whoever it may be, who gains a little nugget of information. So yes, you know, it's an hour of our time. Yes, uh, there are other things that could be done, would be doing, you know, that, that dinner that you got sitting on the table there, that's getting a little cooled off. That's okay. At least you won't burn your tongue now, but you're, you're, you're making a difference. And we, we appreciate you taking the time, uh, Ms. Smith, 
uh, and, and Dr. Broman uh, to, to share with, with our community. Um, as I silently was saying to myself, uh, is that the, the conversation with the 100 started last year. We had numerous to topics that we spoke about and, and a wide range of different age categories that we were trying to bring interest to. Um, as our, our, our target demographic are, are the children, the youth, uh, uh, specifically of those of color um, and those that, you know, just need somebody to, to give them some more guidance. That's what we're here for. And so the conversation with the 100 uh, tonight is a two part series. Uh, we're going to start off with the healthcare 2.0. And then I want you to come back a little bit later. Uh, if for some reason you have to step away uh, for our second part of our session, uh, starting at the top of the hour, where we'll start, talk, start talking about some of the soft skills. So uh, I see that we still have uh, some people that are, are kind of chiming in. But I think in the, the respect for everyone's time, especially Ms. Smith and, and Dr. Broman, I'd like to go ahead and get started um, with this conversation tonight, specifically talking about the healthcare and how we can do better as individuals and what to be aware of. And I know that through the Texas, Kid Texas Kidney Foundation, you guys are gonna give us a lot of information. So I hope that everybody is joining in tonight you know, take a minute, go grab that pencil, grab that piece of paper, because this is your, you know, this is your time to ask some questions to make sure that not only are you protected, but think about that other family member, that other coworker, that other individual that, that, that's important to you, that you may want to slip them a little note, send them a text message, send them an email going, hey, have you ever thought about this? Does this apply to you? So, so be, be attentive, uh, take some good notes, ask some great questions, and then let's have a good time. So on that note, um, Doc, uh, Ms. Smith, uh, I'd like to kind of turn it back over to you uh, as we go into the, the discussion, and then you can kind of lead, lead us in through uh, to Dr. Broman and we'll, have some conversation back and forth there. So this is an open dialogue. So anybody that's out there who's chiming in, um, if you'd like to raise your hand, uh, we'll do our best to acknowledge you. Uh, and then, uh, you know, ask your questions while it's right on your mind. So uh, Ms. Ms. Smith, I'm gonna turn it over to you right now. So you did one of mine, you muted yourself too. Can you, can you hear me? Okay. <laughs> um, thank you, President Freeman. Uh, well, let's talk a little bit about kidney disease uh, because kidney disease, you don't feel bad with it. So the best way to find out whether or not you have it is uh, based on testing. So you either need to have the blood or the urine and preferably both tested. Uh, and that's something that Dr. Broman can speak to um, in more detail than, than uh, I, I will. But I will say this to you. Uh, if, you've had, if you've been diagnosed with diabetes, hypertension, uh, cardiovascular disease, or obesity, um, you should get your kidneys checked. When we go out and do uh, kidney checks, um, when we just check kidneys in the general public, so not making a specific call um, to action, but simply checking uh, kidney disease in general, then we find the disease in 36% of the people that we test within our community. When we start looking in and calling for two specific populations, those who have been diagnosed with diabetes, uh, for example, then that number goes up significantly. So it, to anyone who has been diagnosed with those, uh, the aforementioned uh, ailments, diabetes, hypertension, uh, cardiovascular disease, and obesity, get your kidneys checked. And you can do that by going to 
txkidney.org. And you can take a simple uh, 12 question test and we'll send you a, a, an at-home kit that you can uh, test your kidneys at, at home, an ACR test, an albumin creatinine ratio test. It's a urine test. You pee in a cup, dip, take your dipstick, put it on the green board and put your, your phone over that green board. It gives you uh, the results at your home and sends the results to us. Or you can come to our office or we can come to your church, your synagogue, your community center, uh, your place of work, and we can test. We do events all over. We, we are the leaders in technology for uh, testing for kidney disease. We lead not, not only in Texas, but in the nation. We bring the best technology to our community to test for for early identification of kidney disease. Dr. Broman, you okay. want to chime in about, about uh, kidney disease? Now, Dr. Broman is sure. always so um, modest about what he does, but he is uh, one, of, first of all, he was a top doctor, chosen as a top doctor in San Antonio because of the level of care that he gives to people. And I, I just want to point out that in, the African-American community, there has been a lot of discussion about the way that we uh, characterize African-Americans specifically when it comes down to uh, uh, testing for EGFR. That's how you, you know whether your kidneys are functioning well. And Dr. Broman, one of the reasons why I uh, absolutely adore him mm -hmm. is that, uh, Within the testing for kidney disease, there's a question. Is the person before you African-American? And then the other question is all other races. Dr. Broman, long before, and you get two different numbers, you get the African-American number and then the all other races number. Long before people said that it was wrong to do that, Dr. Broman and his practice and all of the doctors in the practice would look at those two numbers and treat African-Americans just like all other races. They didn't differentiate with us. Mm -hmm. That's an important matter that they, that they made the decision to treat us as all other races. And the reason why that's important is because the EGFR equation was making us look a little bit healthier than we are. And so that's how you get, you know, big mama and them going into, <laughs> into renal failure and nobody, nobody knew that they were that sick, right? By adjusting properly, they're able to help you keep your health and help you make good decisions in a timely manner for your health. So, uh, there's something to be said for doctors. Every doctor is not the same. Anyway, go ahead, Dr. Broman. <laughs> th th thank you, Tiffany. And again, thank you, Mr. Freeman and TAN TV. Uh, great to be here. Uh, Tiffany is absolutely correct. Uh, you know, one of the challenges of what we do is if I were a plastic surgeon and I operated on somebody, I could show them in the mirror the results of uh, the the uh, procedure and the outcome, and they would immediately be pleased with it or not. With hypertension and diabetes, these are fairly silent illnesses. Um, and I thought that's uh, why you muted us, Mr. Freeman, to kind of uh, set the tone. The, the, the disease is, is truly silent. People don't know that they walk around with high blood pressure uh, they don't know that they may be spilling protein in their urine and protein in the urine is a marker for kidney disease. It is the most important marker uh, initially when it comes to kidney disease. Um, in the African-American community, I think awareness of the problem is high, as well as the prevalent uh, prevalence of uh, disease, hypertension, diabetes, etc. Yet when it comes to treatment and getting blood pressures 
uh, to goal in managing diabetes, uh, we have fa fairly inequitable results uh, when it comes to the African American community and our uh, uh, communities of minorities. And uh, the reasons are many and multifactorial, but I think what, where our focus should be is to bring further awareness, encourage uh, our, uh, our communities to come forward and to seek care and to be aggressive in getting to goal. Uh, uh, the, the challenges that we face are many because uh, some of them are beyond our reach. For example, the food industry. We can't control the food industry in large scale uh, in venues like this, but we can certainly educate our uh, constituents to uh, do the right thing. Uh, as Absolutely. Americans, fast food is a, a, a very popular thing that we all do. We have busy, fast paced lives and it's a uh, quick and easy to, to grab something from any of these restaurants that we drive by several times a day because there's one at every street corner. Well, mm -hmm. food that's prepared outside of the home is prepared full of sodium and full of uh, uh, fat and not ideal fats such that it tastes better and it appeals more to us. So the same thing that we can prepare at home, we do not uh, uh, do so and we buy outside. I think food preparation is key because you can control the amount of sodium. People don't realize that when you eat outside, you can uh, quadruple the amount of sodium that you actually need. And that raises the blood pressure. So we have people walking around on four or five medications, not getting to goal because their lifestyle is not uh, the appropriate lifestyle. Um, people walk into the office, they don't realize they have a blood pressure of 200 over 100 when a normal blood pressure is less than 140 over 90. Well, that can result in stroke. It can result in congestive heart failure, heart attacks, and it can result in uh, progressive kidney failure. Uh, progressive kidney failure itself uh, there are five stages of chronic kidney disease. Stage one is normal kidney function with minor abnormalities. It could be a kidney stone. It could be blood or protein in the urine, but the function is normal. That would ideally be the time to catch people to prevent progressive disease. Stage two is between 60 to 90% function. Stage three is between 30 to 60% kidney function. And stage four is 15 to 30 percent kidney function stage five is less than 15 percent that's when people end up on dialysis generally speaking you would be surprised that a person with stage five kidney disease can walk into my office not knowing they have chronic kidney disease it is it, truly the, silent disease yeah because they don't feel bad they don't they feel don't bad. feel bad at all so it That's makes my not... job challenging to convince them that they actually do have a problem. Unfortunately, people have chest pain. They know they may have, they may be having a heart attack or they may have heart failure when they're short of breath. However, with kidney disease, you don't necessarily have to have any symptoms. And your chief complaint is, doc, my labs look abnormal. So I think uh, we have to spend the time to explain to people that you actually do have this problem and then come up with treatment plans that make sense based on people's situations and lives. Tiffany, you want to say? Yeah, something? I wanted to say, you know, that's why we came up with uh, the Silent But Deadly campaign, because awareness, uh, when by the time they get to Dr. Broman, um, it's it too late. late. Yeah. So what we're trying to do uh, with, with all of our resources is identify the disease early. And that is why we started the Silent But Deadly campaign. And that is why we have the most wonderful spokesperson, Reginald Ballard. Uh, uh, he's a, a great American actor. He was a bro man from the fifth floor uh, in the Martin Lawrence show. <laughs> And 
he just um, he lost his kidneys and his wife uh, was a perfect match for him. And he ended up doing a uh, peer donation uh, to to get a kidney transplant. And, and I will tell you that he is uh, just a wonderful advocate for uh, kidney patients. He's very dedicated to getting the word out about kidney disease and all of the options that one has when they're in renal failure, but also early identification. Um, uh, he and Edie, his beautiful wife, um, both believe in healthy eating and they're completely dedicated to um, what is being put in, in their mouths and the outcome that, it, that their bodies uh, get from that, fueling their bodies with the best possible fuel. Um, and I just have to say that, that you're gonna see more of uh, Mr. Ballard and our wonderful, you know, Mr. Ballard is the original bro man and uh, Dr. Broman is a nephrology bro man. <laughs> You know, and between the two of them, I feel like we're going to take the take the state by storm and definitely take Bear County by storm, because our goal is to make sure that that uh, people know about this disease early. Eighty percent of uh, in stage renal disease could be prevented if it's if kidney disease is identified early. So. This is about maintaining quality of life and everything that Dr. Broman just said about food is incredibly important to uh, maintaining our quality of life. We, we definitely would have less people on dialysis or requiring a kidney transplant if uh, we didn't rely only on medications and pills to treat our patients. I think lifestyle is a, a highly important component of uh, uh, any patient's medical care. And unfortunately, physicians aren't necessarily trained in lifestyle. Uh, and they very quickly and loosely say, you have to diet and exercise. But what does that mean? Mm -hmm. People don't know what that means. People have their own version of what that may mean, and it's not necessarily going to be a healthy version. Uh, you know, there are many fads out there. There are many diets out there. Uh, I think everybody has heard of the ketogenic diet or high protein diets, and uh, they may work for many people in, in their own right. They may be uh, appropriate diets for many people, but not for kidney patients. Uh, somebody who goes on a high protein diet can lose their kidney function very rapidly. So lifestyle modification has to be under su supervision with a medical team, a dietitian, a doctor, and, and mm -hmm. all the interested parties. But it is the uh, Achilles heel of uh, what we do when it comes to hypertension. Because I frequently prescribe and patients go home and they do what they do. So as we continue to have the conversation, hopefully more and more people will hear these stories and hear, hear about uh, uh, the good outcomes they can have and be encouraged to uh, uh, change their health. I think diabetes obviously is a, a D number one cause of kidney disease in our nation, and it goes hand in hand with hypertension. African-Americans are salt sensitive. They retain salt and water more. Uh, our communities, in our African-American communities, we have higher BMIs, high, higher rate of obesity. And, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the same patient can go to a doctor's office and not necessarily get the same treatment or results or uh, the same, the, the adequate care that they deserve when it comes to uh, explaining the opportunity and, and the things that need to be done. So because of that, a lot of people decide I'm not going back. I'm not going to go take care of myself. And that would, that would really be detrimental to what we're trying to accomplish as a, as, as a, as a group. Now at, at Texas Kidney Foundation, we offer 
uh, along the lines of what Dr. Broman was is talking about, we uh, had to think through what when we identify kidney disease, what next? You know, what do we do next? Because you can't just tell someone that they have something that uh, is is eroding their health and not give them solutions. So we have renal dietitians. We have uh, your renal dietitian will call you every week if that's what you need. We have uh, exercise programs. We Our goal is to meet you where you are. So what do you need and how are we going to get you there? And that's what, uh, you know, that's part of our continuum of care. And that's part of what we're we're uh, offering to our, our public. We have thought through all of the things that anyone might ask for and might request or might need uh, in terms of, of uh, what are the next steps. What we want is to offer the service to the public. So uh, Mr. Ballard, that we're all aligned. Uh, Reginald Ballard, our spokesperson is 100% uh, sold out to the idea of helping in this way. He's from the Galveston area and uh, has been coming back to Texas to help his community. You know, I mean, he could just stay in LA and just live his life. And he, and he chooses to come here. Dr. Broman chooses to spend, spend his free time uh, on the weekends, taking phone calls from me uh, on the weekday at 6.30 in the morning. Uh, and he, he thinks I never sleep. He never sleeps either. Um, <laughs> because we, you know, it keeps us awake, all three of us awake and needy, thinking about what, What's next? How do we reach our people? And how do we uh, make sure that COVID-19 isn't, that they're not vulnerable to this disease, COVID-19, uh, that that's plaguing us right now and whatever comes next. You know, COVID is using diabetes as, as a way to uh, attack the body. But there, there's always something. So taking back our health and being proactive about our health, that's imperative right now. And I think we can see that. I completely agree. I think uh, COVID-19 highlighted the fact that uh, we need to have a healthier society. Those who and not everyone, but the majority of those who were healthy who got COVID uh, did okay. Uh, you do hear stories of even people who were vaccinated and so forth uh, 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 did poorly. But when you look at everything statistically, uh, a lot of people who were unhealthy were the ones who got sick and unfortunately uh, succumbed to COVID-19. So I think we have to be very uh, 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 aggressive at, at uh, um, endorsing health and, and uh, uh, pushing for people to change their lives and, and uh, get healthier so that they can overcome any acute illness that may affect them adversely because they, have, they may have high blood pressure, diabetes, or obesity. President Freeman. Yes, ma'am. All right. So uh, this this has been extremely exciting. I mean, uh, I'm sitting here just jotting down a lot of notes because you guys have, have sparked a lot of lot of thoughts that you know. Because Tiffany, you had said that you know you had what seven people in your family had died from from kidney failure and kidney what? problems. I, and, uh, Mr. Freeman, I would like to. Uh, jump in because you brought up uh, you just touched oh. on something that I wanted to mention and this is very specific to the African American co uh, uh, community 
with Tiffany having so many family members and many of our friends and families having loved ones who have been afflicted by hypertension and kidney disease, it makes you think whether there's a genetic basis for all of this. And uh, uh, I will tell you that there are genetic predispositions that, that can make somebody's hypertension very aggressive and result in poor outcomes with kidney disease and cardiac disease. And uh, there's a APOL1 gene that we look for and test for. I test for that in all of my African-American patients because if they are APOL1 positive, then they need to know that that increases their risk for mm. poor outcomes. And that encourages them to be more aggressive than uh, the person next door. And uh, the other thing I want to highlight is that kidney disease is a risk factor for heart disease, just like smoking, just like diabetes, hypertension, kidney disease is also a risk factor. So if your brother, sister, or your friend has high blood pressure, diabetes, but no kidney disease, and you have kidney disease on top of those two conditions, you need to know you have a higher risk for cardiovascular mortality and morbidity, and it behooves you to be that much more aggressive to control the disease states that you can. And diabetes and high blood pressure are highly controllable. And we would be remiss if we didn't push for people to get to goal. Um, and, and let me jump in on that too. Uh, when, I took my, when I took over the Texas Kidney Foundation, I was doing so because I'd lost nine family members at that time. And I thought there was something genetic. So I was looking for that genetic connection and everyone was telling me that there wasn't. So I went to the largest uh, um, conference that was going on at the time. And that was uh, in, in DC and started just trolling around looking for somebody who was studying uh, genetic links uh, that, that led to African-Americans and found APOL1 there. Uh, that was in 2017 and started going to the stakeholders meetings. Uh, anyway, uh, long story short, uh, in April of 2021, I was one of 17 authors on uh, a paper on APOL1 and my family does have APOL1. And this guy here is the one who uh, <laughs> tested me for it. <laughs> you know, and it was a difficult, difficult test to, uh, it, the test wasn't difficult. It was just uh, the emotional side of, of taking that test and having to explain to my parents that, that uh, you know, this was something genetic um, because that is a hard, uh, a hard conversation to have. Parents don't want to, they, they want to blame themselves for it. And that is not, not the road to go down. You know, we, we have to find out that we have this so that we can protect ourselves. Absolutely. And, uh, you, you know, yeah. And, and, and um, you know, and again, as you were kind of talking about the, the impact on your family, initially in my thought process was, and I've been pretty blessed with it. Uh, but then, you know, Dr. Broman said, hey, look, dialysis. And that all of a sudden that, that it, it, it brought me back to reality because uh, just a little over uh, 10 years ago, uh, that's, I lost my, my brother to dialysis and kidney failure mm -hmm. uh, associated with it. And I, I thought of the, the horrific situation that he had put himself in because one, he, he decided that he would never take a kidney transplant, which I thought that was kind of crazy. Uh, and then secondly, that um, he was tied to this machine for the rest of his life to, to, to do the functions that his body would no longer do. Uh, and so he couldn't come and visit me when I was living in Germany. He couldn't come to visit me in Texas. He, he, he was, you know, without a lot of logistical uh, coordination to, to be able to do it. So mm -hmm. the a question that I kind of have, and then I kind of turn it over to the, to the individuals that are here, if we had to, to kind of nick down a couple of two or three, five, whatever the right number is, key things that I would have to do if I was diagnosed 
with a kidney disease today so that I could have longevity or improve my quality of life, what would those key things be in, in a short blur? You know, as I say, it's, you know, it's just, it's gotta be Arkansas proof, you know, just no big words, no big letters, long sentences, you know, hit, 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 hit me, hit the nail on the head for me. Very, 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 uh, good question. And very simple answer. Uh, Lower the blood pressure to less than 135 over 85. Follow a low sodium diet. Use a lifestyle modification method that works for you to get your weight down and your body fat percentage down to close to 20% or less. And uh, do aerobic and uh, uh, weight training exercises to get in uh, uh, good shape and uh, um, make sure you visit your uh, provider uh, on a routine basis to get the appropriate blood test and screening so that uh, you know what you're doing is working. Outstanding. Outstanding. The, I mean, that sounds way too simple, you know, and, but it, it changes your life, doesn't it? It, it does. You know, uh, frequently you hear people say, I ask them, how's your blood pressure at home? I take my medicine is the answer I get. And unfortunately, that taking your medications is not equivalent to being at goal. So the other message is check your blood pressure routinely at home, get a blood pressure machine, invest in it because it's a small price to pay for a, a great outcome to have. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, and, and it's just, you know, it's, it's too easy. Just do the right thing for yourself. So, I mean, I, I've got a couple of other questions, but uh, I'd like to see if some of our guests that are on here have some questions that they would like to ask Dr. Broman or uh, Tiffany uh, before we kind of start wrapping it up. So I'll open it up to, to the floor. Usually Ernest Jones is, is w with his, background and, and some pharmacies and, and things like that it has a good question or maybe our 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 vice president of programs uh, doc, uh mr warren roseboro uh he, he can tell us some of the initiatives that he's got going on from the 100 uh that is is going to hopefully help make a difference in our our members lives and their families so any comments from anybody keto you know, Darius, you know, Jasmine. No, everybody's being quiet. It's been, you see, I, sometimes when you put people on the spot, they, they kind of jump in there. So if you do have a question, please, please let me know. Um, the, when we talk about fast food, uh, I'm going to go back to that, that one question. Um, and, you know, we, we are living the fast life. Um, and based on requirements, if I had a, a desire and I ate more vegan versus soul food versus what characteristic genre, however we want to, to group it, which one would be a better choice for me? Excellent question. I, I think plant-based diets, uh, <laughs> Do uh, uh, there, there have been studies to demonstrate that plant-based diets may be favorable uh, 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 for health reasons? Um, there's a great show on Netflix called The Game Changer, mm -hmm. and uh, if anyone's watched that show, you you would see that the defensive unit of the Tennessee Titans. Where it went all plant-based and one of uh, the, the wives of one of the defensive players uh, was a chef. So she started preparing meals and actually giving it out to all the players. Uh, their performance skyrocketed physically. Uh, their, uh, but there's, there's a lot of data to suggest that uh, not necessarily a vegan, but a vegetarian and plant-based diet is uh, uh, good for vascular health and uh, also for uh, kidney health. However, being that we live in the real world, uh, I think that uh, animal-based products are a part of our daily lives and it would be 
hard to tell people who have been living with them for 50, 60 years to all of a sudden go vegan or, or, or go plant-based unless they so desired. So I, I think the message is introduce vegetables and fruits and fresh products into your diet on top of whatever else you are doing and substitute the the bad man-made carbs like wonder bread for you know <laughs> spinach and lettuce and 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 all the natural carbs that are plentiful in our lives outstanding mm-hmm. outstanding so um Last year, as part of our, our 100 days of, of health that, that we initiated, uh, my wife and I uh, consciously did exactly what you said, Dr. Broman. We, we thought about what we were doing, and we, and we, we went on a journey, um, and it's helpful when you have a partner or have somebody to, to, to help you through that whole process. Um, but part of that journey was, uh, it was four-phased. One we did portion control. Um, mm. And so, you know, they say eating less than the size of your fist, right? As a portion control. Uh, secondly, uh, we reduced our sugars. Uh, third, we, we tried to increase our lifestyle and activity. And for me, it was the, the basis of the 10,000 steps a day, um, mm. which, you know, through all of the, your phones and Google fit and, the eye watches, it's kind of easy to track those kind of steps. And it, it really, you know, even during a pandemic, I found out I could put 10,000 steps inside my house if I needed to, just walking from the kitchen to the living room, to the bathroom, and just getting up every hour and having activity. And then the last thing that we, we did on that four phase was to increase our water intake. Um, you know, how important is that water intake for that kidney health. Incredible. It's very, yes, <laughs> it's incredibly important. It, it, uh, first of all, you need water for all cellular functions. So, mm-hmm. uh, and then walking around dehydrated uh, uh, makes the kidney uh, uh, adapt and, and, and make changes that it's forced into making. Mm-hmm. And it, it holds on to uh, more salt, if you will. So if you're well hydrated, you get rid of salt better and more easily. Uh, and uh, you, you have better function of all the cells of your body. So I think that's very important. Now, in terms of the quantity of water, a nephrologist went back and looked back at 100 years of data to see where this recommendation for eight glasses of water a day came from, and he could not find it. But I uh, frequently we talk to our patients and they don't drink enough water, especially as they go up in age. And I think that it, it's, it's important to at least uh, uh, drink half a gallon of water a day and to avoid beverages that have nothing to do with water. Uh, exactly. Sodas, and carbonated beverages, not necessarily carbonated water, but carbonated beverages are doing quite a bit of damage to our society, even the diet uh, uh, beverages. There is a study that shows somebody who has drank a soda uh, uh, daily for several years is liable to lose 3% of kidney function per year of life versus the 1% that we normally do after the age of 40. Uh, people who drink Diet Coke on average will lose, uh, will gain 10, uh, eight, eight, eight to 10 pounds in a two year time span, whereas the person drinking the regular Coke uh, will gain 16 pounds. So uh, uh, these are very simple measures that, if eliminated hmm. from our diets, would end up uh, uh, resulting in uh, significant uh, benefit. One of the things we don't realize. Mm-hmm. How many people do you know around you that get knee replacements and hip replacements? Every additional pound of weight that we carry has about a 10 pound impact on our weight bearing joints at rest. If you're walking to try and lose, if you're running all of a sudden to try and lose weight and you're heavy, that impact can be 15 to 20 pounds per every pound that you have on uh, additional pound that you have uh, uh, that you're carrying with you. So 
even from a musculoskeletal standpoint, there's tremendous benefits in eating healthy. Uh, Going back to the plant-based diet, uh, when they look back at the fossils of the gladiators, they found a high degree of strontium, uh, which is a, 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 a an element that is found in our bones. And it was because they had plant-based diets. Now, nobody would believe that because the gladiators, you know, you think of meat eaters who are buff and big and who can fight monsters, but no, they had plant-based diets. So uh, I think you and your wife are on the right track. And and, uh, uh, certainly I think sharing your journey with others is very powerful because when they look at you, they definitely see the results. Absolutely. And, and through that, that journey and, and minimal effort, uh, I lost 25 pounds and, and two inches off my waist. Awesome. Yeah. And so there's a couple of questions that have come in, our comments. Uh, one says, uh, and I think we've kind of addressed this, how about the inclusion of more natural food items instead of processed food items? Does this bear heavily on the causes of diabetic issues? Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. About 50 50 years ago uh, or longer, a Mexican agriculturist won the Nobel Prize in Agriculture for genetically re-engineering wheat. So the bread that you and I consume nowadays has a different uh, 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 chemistry to it such that a serving of bread raises your insulin requirement and your blood sugars more than a serving of sugar. Mm. So, you know that's a man-made food. It's genetically re-engineered and it's not gone through any type of oversight. It's come directly to the consumer, which are you and I. Since that has happened, we have more obesity and hypertension and we have less famine. Uh, But we we know what kills more and it's the obesity and hypertension and diabetes. So absolutely, natural foods are the way to go. But don't forget that cold cuts and food items like that are also processed foods. So it's better to uh, get the, 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 the fresh animal food and prepare it yourself rather than buying anything that's quick and easy. Absolutely. Absolutely. And then one last question here, does the body react to sugar substitutes similar uh, to with actual sugars uh, in regards to uh, pancreatic responses? Excellent question. And we do believe that, uh, uh, yes, it may not raise your sugars, but the insulin response uh, uh, and the metabolic response is there. Uh, again, if, I, if, if you recall, I mentioned that drinking a Diet Coke daily will result in weight gain. The reason we as uh, overweight or obese pac- uh, patients end up with diabetes is Uh, people who carry weight around their abdomen, their abdominal area, have walk around with high insulin levels. And when the pancreas tires out from producing all that insulin, eventually we become diabetic and we start developing insulin resistance and diabetes. So yes, those sugar substitutes in small amounts here and there, maybe, but long-term, they're not the right choice either. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, it, it's been a, a, an extremely educational and enlightening uh, discussion that we've had over uh, the, this session tonight. And I, I want to reach out and, and, and truly say thank you. Thank you. Thank you to the, the two of you for sharing your time and sharing this information with us. Um, as I've said uh, from the beginning and through this one, you know, I, it's it there's always the opportunity to educate one more person. I, and believe me, as I'm sitting here kind of trying to, to juggle three or four balls, as you heard my phone ring and people walking in behind me, you can see uh, it, it's, I, I picked up a lot of information and it, it reminded me, I still have a lot of work to do. Um, there's a lot of more people that I need to continue to reach out uh, through this organization uh, through the community that I live in and around to make sure that, you know, somebody knows about it. You know, that there, you know, as I go into the schools and I'm mentoring these, these young youth and I walk down the, ha- the, the halls and I see these kids that, I mean, whatever they're, they're eating and drinking and the hormones have made them 
three times as bigger than I remember ever the kids being in high school that I went to uh, and the, the full beards and, you know, all of the other different things that, that are changing their lifestyles. Uh, you know, I think there's uh, more opportunities to, Hey, Hey, how much water have you drank today? Hey, what, why are you eating that? Hey, do you ever think about the, the, the effects on your body? Because uh, I'm I'm loud and proud, and I and I, I will call you out in the middle of the hallway or in a in the in the you know in, in a banquet and say, hmm, okay, that sure is a lot of macaroni and cheese you got going on there. So um, at this point, uh, do do either uh, of you have any closing comments uh, before we close out this session and transition? I want to say good for you for for calling people out and educating people mr freeman the other the last comment i want to make to 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 give an example and make it real uh went to el pollo loco with my mom and sister i decided to order the healthy item i ordered a chicken salad well wouldn't you know my chicken salad had more salt in it than my mom's chicken wrap and my sister's chicken sandwich it had 2.3 grams of sodium in it, which is more than our daily allowance. So I, I, I want to just m- m- let people know that they can tell the kitchen to give them a low salt item. And there's no shame in that game. Send the food back, say, I don't want any salt on my food. You have choices, you have options, please exercise. You're muted. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I'd like to say in closing, uh, get your kidneys checked. You know, that that's why we've, we've uh, started the Silent But Deadly campaign. And you can go to uh, silentbutdeadly.org uh, to uh, start the process in getting your kidneys checked today. You can do it right now. Uh, or you can go to txkidney.org. Dot org to, to check out more information about Texas Kidney Foundation and what you can do to be a healthier you. You have the power. So always remember, you're the one who's in control of your health. And today, right now in this moment, you could decide to do something different, to do better, be better, and live better. And that's what we want to help you do. So uh, from Texas Kidney Foundation, on behalf of uh, our team, Reginald Ballard, our wonderful spokesperson, and Dr. Broman, you know, thank you very much for having us here. Outstanding. Again, thank you for both. Uh, you're you're welcome to stay on for the second session, but I, you know that dinner that you you had on the plate on the table <laughs> when we started cooled off well. Now I'm gonna allow you guys to go back to it. Blessings to each and every one of you. Um, thank you. We'll see you in and around the community. Thank you for all Thank that. you, Mr. Freeman. Thank you for having us. Thank Take care. you. Outstanding. Have a great day. All Bye. right. So now, you know, again, as this is an exciting night um, for the conversation with the 100 here uh, on TAN TV, uh, we, again, we want to reach out and say thank you, thank you, thank you for the opportunity to, to continue to partner with TAN TV. Our second second session tonight, we have the honor, the privilege of having Dr. Raylan White uh, here with us tonight, who is going to help us start honing our soft skills. Um, And Dr. White, I would love for you to take the opportunity to introduce yourself uh, as we transition for this next part two of the set of the session. All right, thank you, uh, President Freeman. It's an honor to be here. I am here um, representing Ray, which is an organization that I started. It's Restoring Advocacy for Youth Empowerment. And my and I have a podcast and my uh, co-host is here on, uh, hopefully she can show her face, Keita Pratt. I, there she is. And we do a podcast called Overcoming, and it is helping um, adults to overcome. Well, she does it from the adult side 
uh, work that because she's an adult that is living that's a dyslexic. And so she works on giving them skills on uh, coping with that. I do it from a parent side because my oldest son had it and we walked through the steps that we had to go through in order to um, get over the stigma of being in uh, special ed, uh, the label of special education and how you use it to label a uh, level the playing field in order to become the best version of you. So I speak from a parent side. She speaks from uh, uh, the student, the adult who lived through it. And so she will give uh, her perspective on living with a disability and uh, matriculating through school, job, um, and how she coped with it. I not only am a parent, but I'm also an administrator, a school administrator. And I work with parents uh, trying to help them with their kids. What we do on the advocate side, I help parents to work with the schools in order to make sure that their child is receiving the services that they need in order to um, be the best version or to matriculate through school during that time. So there are some skills that we talk about there and I will let Ms. Pratt introduce herself. Right, all right. Hello everyone, I am Keita A. Pratt. Thank you so much for allowing me to speak this evening. As I am a dyslexic adult, um, and my thing is what I do is assist those like myself with um, the ability to be able to operate day to day with their with their disability. Um, as we know that in the black community, um, this um, special this this particular special needs um, called dyslexia is something that has been whitewashed. So that means literally I bring to my community that there are others in the community that's like me that need someone to stand up for them to be able to tell the story, to be able to have the conversation and be able to give them the tools that they need so that they can be able to perform in the world. Because as we know, um, being for me, being a dyslexic, um, when it comes to uh, day-to-day -day operations when it comes to the world, sometimes if we don't have the tools that we need, we end up in blue collar jobs, we end up in prison, and we end up in situations that we don't desire to have. So pretty much I have taken the forefront to create a nonprofit organization that's called Invisible Ability um, to be able to go in my community and to support people like myself. And pretty much um, that is kind of like where I'm at when it comes to um, dyslexia. Dr. Ray, I'm gonna swing it back to you. All right, well, thank you. One thing, um, I didn't know when we talk about soft skills and I was told it was for college students. So that's why I am proudly showing the banner of the school where I received my bachelor's degree from and my master's from. Prairie View a and University. And one thing I would have to say, and I hope that any person, when they are in um, high school, middle school, uh, element, well, they can't do it elementary, but middle school, high school, all the way through pro post-education, that the first thing you would need to do is to be an advocate for yourself. You have to be willing to go to your teachers, your professors or whomever and ask them uh, for one, if you need help, two, what can you do in order uh, to help your grade? And if you need the tutoring or if you need additional to support on um, to ask for it, do not be afraid to uh, be that advocate in order to make sure that you can obtain what you need to attain for that class. Um, that is, oh, your hand is up. Yeah, j j yeah, because you're you're on the. I got you. Oh, I'm we on the roll. I'm sorry, yeah, we I just saw, go. I'm, like, <laughs> well, I'm out just a little bit. Hey, I love the energy, you, the, both of you guys. Uh, this is going to be an exciting, exciting night there. So that was just supposed to be the introduction. Oh, so. sorry. 
<laughs> it's all good. It's all good. Love, love, love. Uh, also, I want to introduce our, our vice president of programs, uh, uh, Doc, um, Doc. Hey, I'm promoting. I'm giving you a new degree there, uh, Mr. Warren Rosebro. Um, I'm I'm going to have to step away for just a minute, uh, and if there's a question or something before I get back, he's going to pick it up. Um, so, Warren, you want to you you want to introduce yourself real quick? Oh uh, yes. Uh, good evening, everyone. I'm like Abby said. I'm Warren Rose. I'm the vice president of programs for the 100 Black Men of San Antonio. Um, it's a pleasure to have you all on on this session tonight, and thank you for spending the night with us for uh, this hour. Um, Dr. Lynn, I mean, I'm sorry, Dr. White. Uh, I have a graduate of PV, and I have a freshman there now. So, hey. <laughs> the small world. It's all, it's all family. It's all family. Exactly, exactly. So um, for, I think, Brittany and Jasmine are, are uh, members of the Collegiate 100. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Awesome. All right. And there was another gentleman, and I think he dropped off. So for both of you uh, that are on there, on here, there's a pre-test link um, that I put into the chat that I need you to go in, uh, hit the hyperlink or paste it to your um your web page and go ahead and do that pre-test um, survey that's in there uh, so that we can get you enrolled into this, this whole conversation uh, and, and get, get you credit for your participation on this one. Because as we go through this whole process of the soft skills, we wanna identify and make sure that it's, it's giving you an opportunity to, to learn and hone your skills. So on that note, uh, I'm going to turn it back over to you, Dr. White, and I'm going to step away for just a minute and then I'll hop back on. I have a quick question. Yes. On the link that you put in the chat, it says name of a hundred black men chapter. Which chapter is this? That's going to be San Antonio. Oh, <laughs> okay. Thank you. Okay. Good question though. All right. Dr. White. All right. Um, when it comes to soft skills and I, uh, I'm just assuming it was for, for college and not um, in, in general. So I'm gonna try to hit both of them. And uh, Ms. Pratt, please uh, step in when, when um, you feel that there's a need there. So again, the first one I would say is to learn how to be an advocate for yourself. You need to know your learning style and what, um, how you learn. Because teachers teach, normally they teach the way that they learn. And it may not be in the same way or the same form that you do, which will make the class uh, just a little bit more difficult for you to understand. Um, I do know from when I was in the classroom, um, I did have to learn how to teach. Um, we call it random because I'm an analytical person. It was very easy for me to teach that way. But my oldest son is um, a random, he learns randomly. And so when he had told me when he was three that I, he couldn't learn from me because I didn't teach the way he would learn, I, I thought about all of the students that I was not uh, reaching. So that's when I did a lot of research and brain-based uh, education and realized the person that needed to change was, was me, the way that I would deliver the information. So I made sure that I delivered the information in two different ways, analytically and random, so that all of my, my students will have that opportunity. So it's very important that you would do a learning assessment so you will know how you learn in order for you to be able to figure out how the material needs to be uh, introduce or present it in order for you to understand it better. Um, being an advocate also is another one. And then also time management to make sure that you're giving yourself enough time in order to complete your assignment. Um, one thing that I, I have, I strongly disagree with that we do in public education is to give the students all these opportunities to make up and make up, make up because um, it's not giving them a sense of there is a deadline that stuff needs to be uh, turned in and needs to be done, but um, you need to know how um, to manage your time 
uh, be an advocate. And I'm all, and if you notice, that's my teaching. I'm always going to repeat so we can make sure that you understand what what um, you're getting, what I'm trying to get over the main points. So not only with the time management, being an advocate, knowing your learning style, knowing the resources that's out there for you. You may have to uh, talk to a counselor. Um, most colleges have um, an advisor. You can go to the advisor to make sure that you are using all of the resources that are available to you uh, wherever you go. Most schools have a library. They have a tutoring se section there. Um, get you a study buddy. Whatever you would need in order to um, make sure that you're learning to the best of your ability. And even if you have a learning disability, that cannot and should not stop you. Uh, my oldest son, like I said, he uh, is dyslexic dyslexic as well. He's working on his master's at Baylor, but that was because when he was younger, I made sure that he learned the techniques um, that he could use in order to help him overcome what he needs to uh, in order to grasp the material. So at that point, I would swing it back to my partner in crime, Ms. Pratt. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Um, so pretty much Everything you stated, Dr. Ray, is, I mean, is very important. And those are some skills. As been a dyslexic, is so necessary, especially advocating for yourself, knowing how to speak up for yourself, knowing how to have the conversation and not being afraid. I love the fact to like to have a community of people to be able to assist you when you are having your shortcomings because you need a community, you need a body of people to be able to help you along the journey. As me as being a dyslexic, for me, it's, it, I self-advocate for myself till today it, because here's the deal. If we, if we don't stand up for ourselves based on letting people know the, the extra um, time and we may need, the extra mm -hmm. assistance we may need, then we're doing nothing but failing ourselves, right? So for me, even though I am a big girl, I still have challenges sometimes asking people or informing people, hey, I need a little more time. Hey, I need to review this information before I can actually get on the platform to speak. Um, and so it's, it's so good when you have a community of people that you can share your shortcomings with because they give you the confidence that you need to be able to have these conver conversations in your community, out like outside of your community, when you're not with your 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 peers and, and the people that you know that you feel safe with, um, you know. Also, for me, knowing that um, me having this this disability, you know, when I when I'm sure of myself, based on when I am self aware of myself, right. It allows me to be able to uh, point out the triggers that I may have when it comes to my breakdowns, because as a dyslexic, sometimes you get into arenas that you feel you, you feel small and you're really not that small. But when you have people that have your back and pushing you you would definitely be self-aware to know your emotions and know how to handle those needs because of the community you surround yourself with. Dr. Ray, I swing it back to you. All right. Well, I'm going to swing it to Mr. Warren. Uh, yes. Uh, Dr. Ray, you mentioned that students might want to get a learning assessment done. Mm -hmm. How would they go about, about doing that? Is that you something can they can go to a school or a website or how would they go about doing that? Yes, you can go on websites um, in order to do it. Because I, when I was in the classroom, I just used one from off the internet because it was easier, easy for the kids to get to. And the results are immediate. So it will tell you if you need, like for me, um, when I have to write uh, or do any type of research or anything, I like what well, I have to write it out. Bef um, I know we could type it, but to me, it's easier for me to learn it faster if I write it. 
And so um, you just have to, it, it'll tell you, I, I wish, because we normally have all of the, the information, but um, I don't have like one in particular, just give me a few minutes, I probably can get one, where I can give you to um, go and take one, but any type of learning assessment that you can do online will give you the information that you need. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. and, uh, uh, learning styles is another thing that is called your learning style. All right. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Mm -hmm. Pratt, I have a question for you. Uh, mm -hmm. In our mentoring organization, we mentor uh, mostly high school students, um, young men of color. And, and you know, as young, well, as young Black men, we're not always forthcoming with things we are dealing with. And dyslexia may be one of the things that some of our young men are too ashamed to admit they have. Um, what would you suggest for myself and Mr. Jones and the other students on the, on the call? Uh, what would you suggest that we try to impart to them to help them overcome that, that barrier, that fear of uh, letting people know they have this, this uh, I don't, I don't know if that's not a disease, but this learning, this learning disability. This learning difference. Yes, sir. So pretty much um, having that conversation with the with especially young males, right? So I found that some of my church members that are you and they are black males that have dyslexia. So for me, like having the conversation based on simply just getting to know a person at the core, right? And then being able to have those vulnerable conversations because having that conversation is not easy to let people know, hey, I struggle with reading. I struggle with writing. So that being said, you take these young men into safe places and safe environments and have the conversation. Hey, what are your shortcomings? What, you know, what are you nervous about the future? Um, you know, are you, you know, when it comes to comprehension, what do you, you know, far as your, you know, are you comfortable where you're at far as, you know, how you comprehend um, the things that you're doing in day to day in your classes? Do you feel like you need extra help? Do you feel like, you know, it's the pace is too fast? Just having general conversations to make them feel safe, but not making them feel judged. Um, so pretty much that's kind of like what I can say based on me having those conversations with some of my youth in my in my church regarding, hey, you know, I know how it feels, but some of them don't want to open up. But getting vulnerable with them and letting them know that they're in a safe place and they can have this conversation and that it will not go outside of whomever they have in that conversation with. So knowing that they can trust you with something that is so near and dear to that heart. Hopefully I answered your question. Uh, yes, you did. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dr. White, do you have anything else on that? Yes, for me, because um, I just recently moved down to the younger age, I have to get through the parents to get the parents to understand that it's okay that your child uh, will be in a label um, in special ed because we use it to, again, level the playing field. We don't use it as a crutch and it is not a bad level uh, label. So uh, when I was on the secondary level, the thing was for me is to get the kids to accept. And then if we can get them to accept that they have the disability, then to get to teach them the techniques and the tools in order to um, get over it. My, my son, um, who was an athlete, went to school on the basketball uh, scholarship was not afraid to let people know. And to this day, still, it's not a shame to let people know that he does have a learning built, a disability. Matter of fact, because that's the first thing he would tell you. But it's because I was telling him it's okay. And it is, um, as long as you do what you need to do to get over it, you don't use it as that. So it, it's just building um, the kid's uh, self-esteem, letting him know that it, it's okay. Um, we all have something wrong with us. 
you know, some of us is physical, some of it is mental, some of it is just, we, we don't have any control of that. And so if we can accept who we are and that we all need something, you know, for, for some people we can use makeup and you don't even know what's wrong with us. So someone has something and it's just to give them that, um, the, the notion that it's okay to be different. And, but because you're different, it doesn't make you any better. I even had parents to ask me when I was a principal and I would tell them I'm sitting in the art. It's okay. While these parents are denying services because they didn't want their child label. I'm like, it's okay. My son is in it. And they were like, what? You let your child be in it? Yes. Because it's allowing him to learn the techniques and it's leveling the playing field. And um, I even told him when he went to college, I kept his um, last art in the envelope. And I said, son, when you start having issues, take this paperwork to student services and they will have to help you. But he knew it was after he went to the coach and they got tutors, he did everything he can do. Um, and then, but he didn't even have to use it until his senior year uh, in Oklahoma. So as long as we give the kids the confidence the tools that they need, and and again, the, just let them know the resources that are out there for them to use. The, the sky is the limit, no matter what the disability is. And the only thing that would limit them is them and if they allow the disability to do so. I think that's very important that, that you mentioned that, to let them know that it's okay a lot of times they may not hear that either from their parents or, or their peers or family members. Uh, they may be, they may hear the opposite, that something is wrong with them, and, and that's totally uh, far from the truth. Um, since, yeah. we on, since we're on this topic of soft, of soft skills, we on this topic, my, my wife is in the other room, so excuse me. Uh, since we're on the topic of soft skills, uh, Public speaking is one of those skills that uh, a lot of people have a fear of. Uh, do you have any uh, suggestions or recommendations of some organizations that can help uh, our young college students uh, overcome those uh, the fear of public speaking? Um, you know, the number one place for me was church. <laughs> <laughs> that was the number one place. And uh, I will never forget when I had to, I did the, the church announcements and I read them so fast that the pastor got back up and say, since Raylan has given us a lesson on speed listening, we will have her to come back <laughs> and redo it. So um, it's just, a, um, I don't know of any um, organization that will teach just public speaking, but I am, I do tell um, when I work with athletes who are trying to uh, get to college, I do tell them to be involved with at least three different organizations and that they need to hold um, an office in at least one of them so they can practice their uh, public speaking. Um, also to be a tutor if they um, can do that and feel comfortable to doing that uh, community service. So I always steer uh, the youth that I uh, mentor or do my career and college um, readiness counseling with uh, to do those things so they can obtain those skills because they need to start working on their resume. I tell them as soon as sixth grade on for even trying to go to college and they go sixth grade. Yes, competition is getting hard. The money, you know, the money is out there but they have like millions of people trying to get that money too. So we have to make you stand out. And so those are the things that uh, I truly believe trying to get, like I say, involved in at least three different uh, community organizations. And like I say, for me, the first one will always be church um, and either some junior club that's out there, especially if they can do some internships, anything that can get them those soft skills, especially if they know what they wanna major in when they go to college. All right, thank I you. I hope I answered your question. Thank you, Dr. White. Uh, Ms. Pratt? 
All right, it is back to me. So I am answering the same question, right? <laughs> All right. So pretty much when it comes to public speaking, this is what I would say. You have to challenge yourself, right? So that literally means that, hey, get in front of yourself in the mirror, get in the mirror, right? And, and take that, 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 that piece of paper and, and, and recite that paper, that, that, that paragraph or that sentence, right? In the mirror, to yourself, like out loud, right? So that you can get comfortable with seeing yourself in, in, in this particular environment, right? Standing up and speaking, right? Also, get into a safe place. Get into a safe place. Find someone, a friend, someone that can literally help you based on challenge yourself. Be like, hey, I, I you know, I need to practice my public speaking and I'm nervous, I'm afraid. Hey, would you be able to be an audience for me, right? Stand before me so I can so I can do this, right? And also, you know, when you're up there and you're standing up there and you're talking and you get fidgety, you get nervous, sometimes you hold like a paper clip in your hand or something so that the nerves that you won't have those nerves that really go super crazy. As we know, the nerves are necessary. So we're gonna get nervous. Um, so that is what I would say. Um, as being, you know, a person with, you know, a learning difference, um, it becomes easy for those that have learning differences to public speak because clearly reading something um, off a sheet of paper, off a teleprompt is very challenging, right? Because here's the deal. Like for me, I have issues with reading and writing, right? So in punctuation, in, in pronunciation. So it's, it's challenging for me to read something. But if you ask me a question, I can give it to you right off my dome because I feel more comfortable and that is more safe for me, right? So pretty much I would say, take a challenge, get in that mirror, recite that, um, recite what you're trying to do based on that sentence, that paragraph, get into your safe environment and have and stand before them to be able to recite those things. As Dr. White stated, I also did a lot of speaking in my church as well. And that is a safe place. So that is all I have. Hopefully I answered your question. I'm done speaking. <laughs> oh, yes, you did. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So I guess the gist of it is challenge yourself and, and put yourself in, in positions where you are forced to uh, to speak in front of people and get comfortable with it, because that's the only way you're going to get comfortable with it is by doing it. Hey, Warren, I, I could dive back in there and kind of add on to it. So today I was up at uh, one of the mentoring sessions and, you know, exactly what they, they spoke about is what we, we kind of added into the, the discussion points. Uh, before they could answer a question, um, that word that I just said was the first thing that came out of their mouth. And I kept cutting them off and I said, nope, you can't go now. And they were like, well, what, what is it? I'm thinking, I'm thinking. And I said, what you need to do is think inside and talk outside. So instead of saying, um, pause, think about it, and then start talking. Um, and they, they, they caught it after a couple of times. And it's okay during the, the conversation to have an um and ah, you know, not a whole lot of it, of course. But the, the key point is you can do anything that you want to do. You just got to think through the whole process. And instead of reacting to the, the whole situation, think about what you need to be doing. And I related it over to if you got pulled over by a police car or you got in, in trouble in the classroom or whatever it may be, if you re are reacting versus thinking, you're going to get yourself in a whole lot of trouble. So think through the whole process. And they got it after a little while. But, you know, high school kids are so excited that first thing they're like, oh, 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 me, 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 me. No, not you. And move over. So uh, it's just just little techniques there. I mean, I was blessed, as they said, that uh, the doing it in the church um, in high school, I was part of the the what we had was the not the, we had the honor society, but we had a beta club and, you know, the the B plus kind of people. So somehow I, I went to the state convention and won. And then they said, hey, Ivory, let's let's go to the national convention. And I said, 
where's it at? And they said, Atlanta. I said, let's go. And they said, well, we want you to run in Atlanta. And I said, no problem. And all the next thing I knew, I was speaking in front of like 3,000 people. And I was got out in that stage and they talked about, think about them in your underwear. And that's all I could think about. But it, rehearsal, practice, it, 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 it was, I got through it uh, and it was exciting. And I think that started my whole career about public speaking. I have no fear of it anymore. When I was working on my doctorate, one thing, because um, we would have class um, on the Hill, because I went to UT Austin, um, one thing that our professor always told us is if we can remember this, you thank them, you give them praise, you give them hope, and you thank them again, that'll give you time to think of your answer while you are saying all of that. And I tell you, and then they would give us a time limit limit like 60 seconds and you got to get all that in and answer the question in 60 seconds. So um, I think that that is something that we use. I use it when they put me on the spot uh, at a funeral, what at church, at, at school, it works. And uh, it gives you time to just walk through. If you just thank them, give them praise, give them hope, and you thank them again, then you answer the question and you got it right. Outstanding, outstanding. All right. Thank you, thank you. Uh, just, there's this one organization that, that, that I'm aware of that kinds of uh, help with their public speaking, that's, and that's called Toastmasters. So I don't know if any of y'all ever heard of Toastmasters. Um, I know when, when I was in the military, uh, as, a young, as a young military member, uh, that was one of the, the organizations that our senior people try to push us towards just to get that that practice of, of doing speeches and, and that sort of thing. So for, for Brittany and Jasmine, if you never heard of Toastmasters, uh, I'm pretty sure there's a there's a group here in San Antonio that you might can look into. If that's something that you're interested in getting involved in. I'd like to ask uh, our two collegiate What's the largest group you guys have ever had to speak in front of? Brittany? Um, probably like 30 people. 30, Not where a big group. <laughs> well, where was that at? At school. <laughs> okay, so it was more of a, the classroom. Okay, how about you, Jasmine? Yes, Hi, um, I've been a part of a couple of groups. I've spoke at church before and I have a pretty big church. I don't know about how many people, but I go to St. Paul, so I've spoke in front of the whole St. Paul, um, and I've also been in Top Teens, and we've spoke to a lot of people in that as well, so probably 50 and over, Nice, I would say. That's very good, and uh, okay. Yeah, that's why I would say if they are, if the, the student is in an organization, and especially if they are in a leadership role, they would definitely get the experience that they need in order to uh, do public speaking. So that, that's why I was saying I always push them to do some form of organizations. Um, Toastmasters, I guess, because I was thinking more of adults than, than, uh, than youth or college age. Um, for that one, that's why I didn't I didn't mention that one. But even being in Girl Scouts and Boy Scouts, that's another group that they have to do um, a lot of uh, public speaking, and they even have UIL competition competition for um, its auditory. It's the division that it's in. Outstanding! Outstanding! So uh, I know, and and I know, Warren. Uh, you guys were were carrying on the conversation again. I apologize. I had to step away. Uh, it's you know sometimes being the president and being the go to guy, you, you get tasked, and the tasks never stop. Uh, I apologize. I stepped out, but the good thing is this is being recorded tonight. Um, so I'm going to be able to go back and catch that 30 minutes or so that I did not that see. Uh, Warren, were there any other questions uh, that you wanted to present to the group? Uh, not at this time. 
I'm okay. sure something will come to mind. Is, is <laughs> as, you know, because these soft skills are, are important. Um, as as they, we continue to, to mentor and train and develop uh, these, these these young minds and bodies, uh, whether they're they're collegiate chapters or they're high schoolers, um, a lot of our collegiate chapter um, are mentoring uh, the the school at St. Phillips uh, as they hopefully start rolling back in. Uh, and so we want you to, to carry these these thoughts and processes back over to them. Um, the uh, the the effect of what we do uh, it, again is sometimes it's it's unseen victories uh, in the whole process. Uh, and Dr. Raylan White and, and Ms. Pratt, we we, we want to thank each and every both of you. Uh, we want to praise you and we want to thank you. Right, I got two of the three there, and I did it in ten seconds. <laughs> and so we, as we continue to pick up these little tidbits of of, of success points uh, to be successful. Uh, we've got to continue to put these in our kit bag. Uh, we're, I think um, if there's not any significant other points or actually what we'll do is I'll ask uh, Ms. Pratt for any closing comments before I, I wrap up here. Awesome. Um, I don't have too many closing comments. Uh, uh, what was it? Um, closing statements but I will say this um you know being a being a person with special needs um we have to embrace certain skills you know to help us um you know find our way and to be able to problem solve um by having these skills um teaches you know us responsibilities for what we um for, so that we don't have to play the blame game and we can take the responsibility and to have and, and, and to have the ability to adapt to our circumstances and succeed in every aspect of our environment. So it is so necessary to have these conversations. It is necessary to get in our communities and do the work to bring light to something and break something as we call this dyslexia to break the stigmatism of this thing called dyslexia that we call a learning difference. But if we get out there and we have a banner showing people, hey, it is okay to be different. It is okay to stand out. It is okay to be who you are called to be and be who you are. Was it easy for me? No, it has never been easy for me. I had to take the lilies and the valleys to get to where I'm at today because I didn't have the tools that I have today that I am standing before the people and say, you know what? Now is the time for me to stand up for the little black boys, the little black girls that have this, this thing called dyslexia and know that they don't have to dance on the strip pole. They don't have to prostitute. They don't have to be in prison. They don't have to do the things because they don't have the assistance that they could have if people stand up and use their voices. So now is the time that we have to stand up and let our youth know that, hey, now is the time. You cannot be shame about this anymore. And it's OK if you are. But we have to get to a place to have the conversation so that we can continue to break the stigmatisms of these special learning differences called dyslexia. That is all I have. Thank you so much for the opportunity opportunity. I'm done speaking. Awesome. Awesome. Dr. White, uh, your closing comments, please. Thank you. Um, first of all, just thank you for the opportunity to speak and uh, to bring to this platform what I do on a daily basis, and that is to allow students to become the best version of who they want to be. We may have to learn some tricks and some trades uh, in order to get there, but as long as they are productive citizens, that's all that matters to me. And it is my job in order to help them to get there. So um, again, being a mother of a student that uh, has a learning, that has a learning disability and know what I did to help him get where he uh, is today 
is my goal for every little, and I only have boys, so I am very partial to boys. Uh, that's all I have with boys. I have my little princesses that I met along the way, <laughs> but I only birth boys. And so I am very partial to uh, boys and I have trees. I am six feet and, and I'm the shortest person in the house. So I have big trees in my house and I had to make sure that when those big trees walk out into the world, that the world not only saw them as black males, but not, and be afraid of them, but know that they are confident enough to be productive citizen and do what God has made them to be. And that is what I try to do with every student every day that I walk into my building. So thank you. Amen. Woo! I love it. I love it. The energy of both of you is dynamic. You know, it, uh, Dr. White reminded me exactly how small of a world it was. And, you know, I, at first I didn't put the uh, two to two together, but she is, she's been a, a blessing to my life for about the last three weeks now as I got introduced to her and uh, some of the new endeavors that she's uh, engaging on. She is an individual that never, never stops pressing forward, which is beautiful because you know what happens when you, you start dreaming and hoping, you know, I, I, for me, that's when they're throwing some dirt on top of my head, you know. That I'm always, always striving to learn something new every day, no matter how small it may be. And I tell my students in my mentoring program to reflect what was bad yesterday, what was good yesterday, and so that today can be even better than it was yesterday. But if you don't look backwards, you don't know how far you've come or how far you need to go. So I thank each and every one of you for the for the tonight. I want to invite everyone that's on here to come back and join us again on March 10th for our next session with the conversation with the 100 um, with our partnership with TAN TV. I want to thank them, thank them, thank them for their their continued support uh, for the African American community and to help us continue to put out and have a voice in the community. Community, It's a blessing for all of us. Uh, it's a blessing to be here. Uh, and we hope that each and every one of you continues to share this information, this nuggets uh, with someone else that you can bless them and make them a better person um, from this information. Again, on, on behalf of the, the 100 Black Men of San Antonio, uh, this is the conversation with the 100. And we look forward to seeing you on March 10th. Thank you. And have a blessed, blessed evening. Bye-bye.